Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about the marginal product of capital which we sometimes notate MP subscript K or MPK and this video is all about the discrete case. So this is the simplest case where our variables are changing discreetly. You might for instance have a table of information like I have here. These are discrete changes in our variables. Now I should say I will do a video on the continuous case as well. That's when we use mathematical functions to describe our marginal product. And I'll link to that video in the description below when it's ready. All right, to start, we're just going to recognize that economists model the output that a firm or an economy produces as a function of our inputs to production. And those inputs are typically capital K, labor, L, and you might have some other stuff like land and maybe some other stuff still. When we think about our marginal product of capital, well, that's equal to the change in output, the change in Y, when we increase our level of capital, which is K, by some marginal amount. Mathematically, we're going to take the discrete change in output and divide it by the discrete change in capital, and this will be our marginal product. This is all done ceteris paribus, so all of our other inputs to production, our labor, our land, everything else, they're being held constant. We're only changing our level of capital and seeing what happens to Y. So just to go through an example, if we had a table like this, the first column tells us about the total level of capital, that's K. The second column is our total output, that's Y. If we wanted to find our marginal product of capital, we just think to ourselves as we go, for instance, from zero to 50 units of capital, our change in K, our change in capital is 50. Our change in total output is, well, Y increases from zero to 1000. So that change in Y is 1000. So the marginal product of capital is that change in Y, 1000 divided by the change in capital, 50, so all equal to 20. As we go from using 50 capital to 75 capital, our change is, well, 25. Our total output changes from 1,000 to 1,500, so that's a change of 500, an increase of 500. The marginal product of capital then will be that change in output, 500, divided by that change in capital, 25, so 20. In the next change, we're going from 75 to 100 units of capital, so that capital is changing by 25 again. Output goes from 1,500 to 1,900, so that's an increase of 400. Our marginal product of capital then is 400 divided by 25, so equal to 16. The last change, we're going from 100 to 120 units of capital. So our increase in capital is 20. Our output increases from 1,900 to 2,100, that's an increase of 200. So our marginal product of capital is 200 divided by 20, so 10. And here it's worth saying that the formula that we're using when we have discrete changes really gives us an understanding of our marginal product of capital to be in terms of a one unit change in capital. That's really what we're doing when we divide out by that change in capital. We're normalizing the change in output to be in terms of a one unit change in capital. So we can use that interpretation here in the discrete case of our marginal product of capital. Now there are two kind of questions that we, we can ask about our marginal product of capital that are pretty interesting. The first concerns the sign of our marginal product of capital. And in my example here, you can see that all of our figures that we got back are positive, which makes perfect sense. The positive nature of our marginal product of capital means that as we increase capital, we're getting more output. Output is increasing. And that's a fairly natural understanding of how things work in real life. As we increase capital, our output increases. And that's really the expected sign of our marginal product of capital. If we had a negative number for our marginal product of capital, this would mean as we're increasing our capital, our total output is decreasing. Now this would be less common and I think that there would have to be some specific reason why this would happen, but I suppose it's possible. And that's what it would mean if you happen to get a negative value for your marginal product. The second thing that we might ask is what's happening to the magnitude of our marginal product of capital? 
And what we're looking for here in particular is in the case that our marginal product is positive, which is the expected case, we're going to check if those magnitudes are getting smaller and smaller. This means we have something called diminishing marginal product. Now in our example here, initially our marginal product of capital was actually constant. We got 20 and 20. So across these levels of capital, on average, as we're increasing capital, we get an increase of output of 20 per unit of capital that we add. But then in this region, as we're increasing our capital, we get more and more output, but the amount that we're getting is getting smaller and smaller. So 20, then 16, then 10. This reduction in the magnitude of our marginal product of capital is diminishing marginal product. Now, I won't go through it here, but diminishing marginal product is a feature that's quite important in many economic models. So it's a good thing to know how to isolate it and how to see it in our examples. So that's finding our marginal product in the discrete case and seeing diminishing marginal product as well. Now, before I finish the video, I will just lastly remind you again that when we're thinking about marginal product, none of our other inputs to production are changing as we're increasing capital. And this is important because it's this that distinguishes the concept of marginal product from the concept of returns to scale. When we're looking at returns to scale, all of our inputs are changing, increasing by some factor, and then we have a look to see what happens to output. When we're looking at marginal product, we're increasing, in this case, only our level of capital, and then we see what happens. As I said before, the next stage of complexity is to think about our marginal product when we have continuous functions. So I will link to that video in the description when it's done. So that's it for this video though. Thank you so much for watching, and I really hope that the video helped.